grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Jesus is King of the Jews, Son of David. But the wise men, they're Gentiles. And from them we learn that Jesus did not just come to save only the children of David, but earn salvation for all. Ruling over one great kingdom, over one holy Christian and apostolic church. Let us pray. These are your words, Holy Father. Sanctify us in the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. Well, during Advent, our message was, Behold, the King comes to you. And on Christmas Eve, our message was, Christ is born this day in the city of David. On Christmas Day, we sang the prophecy that all government shall rest upon his shoulders, focusing upon what it means for Christ to come in the flesh. And then just before the day of Christmas, New Year's Day, we remembered how Jesus Christ passively kept the law, bleeding for the first time at his circumcision. All of which brings us into a brand new liturgical season, Epiphany which arrives as a miraculous point of light. It is, as the Bible calls it, and I'll do this pretty much through the entire sermon, it's a star, a star in air quotes, that leads those strange characters called magi, pagans really, closer to Jesus. Epiphany is the season of light, but it's also Christmas for the Gentiles. Because at Christmas, Jewish shepherds come to worship the little baby Jesus, followed by old Simeon and Anna in the temple. But today we have the Magi coming all the way from the east, some 700 miles, give or take. And you can't get any more uncircumcised, more non-Israelite, complete Gentile goyim who show up asking, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? Magi were the first Gentile worshipers of the Messiah, leading us to recall with joy that this infant king is for all, yea, even us. The Jews had every reason to anticipate his coming. They were given the name Emmanuel, God with us. They were told that he would be virgin born. They were told he would come from the clan of Judah, the line of Jesse, the town of Bethlehem, Ephratah, it's what they were told. And it's what the faithful believed. They believed the promises. But the Gentiles, they didn't have intel like this. They simply sat in darkness where C.S. Lewis says, it's always winter and never Christmas. The Gentiles had no reason to hope things would ever change. So how did the Magi come to know the truth? Well, most likely it was due to the Babylonian captivity. When a Hebrew by the name of Daniel, you remember him? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. When Daniel won the favor of King Nebuchadnezzar, whom he put in charge over the court of the Magi. The wise men most likely learned from Daniel the promise of the coming Messiah that a seed would come forth from a woman. What? A seed from a woman? Yes. This individual would soon crush the serpent's head. And they probably also learned from the prophecy or from Daniel, the prophecy from the book of Numbers, that this Messiah's star shall come forth from Jacob. So these magi, these wise men, our ancient kinsmen really. They kept these prophecies in mind for generations, passing them down long after Daniel had died. Even after Babylon was defeated by the Persians and the Persians by the Greeks and the Greeks by the Romans, through it all they learned not to trust in earthly kings and empires, for they come and go, but rather to trust in the promise of God of Israel. 
So again, after hundreds of years, Daniel's long gone. Behold, in the darkness of the night sky, a light shines forth. Just as we heard from Isaiah, the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. The Gentiles shall come to your light and the kings to the brightness of your rising. You know, St. Matthew actually records that our ancestors followed the star twice. The first time was when it rose initially. The Magi knew enough that it was over the land of Jacob and how to get there. But to be sure, the star disappears as they make their way to Jerusalem, meaning, again, that this is no ordinary star. It does not operate like any of the stars in the night sky. Now, of course, to them, going to Jerusalem makes sense because that's where it's the place of the kings. This is where the king of kings must be born. And so the wise men ask around town. However, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, they don't know what to tell them. Those in Jerusalem, they stopped reading their Bible a long time ago, not unlike these days. Their children didn't come to Sunday school to hear and learn the stories, and the adults, they hardly made it to church. All the folks in Jerusalem can do is tell the Magi, go, go, go to Herod. Just go to Herod. Now to Herod, news of a new king, this was not good. The question, where is he who's been born king of the Jews? That is a threat to Herod. Because Herod's title was what? King of the Jews. Herod is troubled by what he hears. He's troubled by what he sees, yet he gets what he wants from the Magi. Herod knew who these men were. He gets from them a promise for them to report back and tell him where the child is so that he, as we know, could have the child eliminated. By the way, who do you think motivated that plot to eliminate the Messiah? Yeah, of course. The devil was behind that. Herod's teachers, though, they rummage around in their scroll closet and they find a scroll of Micah which tells them the exact spot of where they were to go. It's Bethlehem. House of bread. Isn't that fascinating? Jesus says, I am the bread of life. He's born in the house of bread. By the way, he's placed in a manger. You know this. What do you do with a manger? What do you do with what's put in the manger? The animals, what? They eat. Jesus says, take, eat. the village of Bethlehem. The house of bread. That's the last place that anybody would dare look. But setting aside their fallen human reason, the Magi follow the words of the prophet Micah. Note that. The star does not guide the Magi straight to Jesus. I'm not against our nativity sets. I used to be. But I'm not anymore. I'm over that. But so many times you have a star. Does have a star here? We have a star over where the little baby Jesus lies. The star does not guide the magi straight to Jesus. It brings them to where they hear the word. For you see, there's another light shining in the darkness, and it's not in the sky. As the psalmist says, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. Which is why, by the way, we have two candles flanking the lectern. Why? Because your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So by means of the scripture, the Magi learn the Savior is just some 15 miles outside of Jerusalem in Bethlehem. And then as they go, the Word of God has already told them where, then as they go, the star reappears. Pointing them to the house where God in the flesh could be found. Our text reads, when they saw the star, this is now the second time 
after visiting with Herod, then they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And why is that? Well, this is God's way of telling our, Je our Gentile ancestors that He is for you. Come and worship Him too. I like to think that they skip all the way to Bethlehem. Our text continues, and when they went into the house, they saw the child. So backing up a little bit, Mary has already had her baby. We know that she lays him in the manger. But Joseph is not going to allow those arrangements to stand very long. Most likely the very next day, he started looking for better arrangements and he found them. Most likely as a carpenter, he found work in Bethlehem too. Everybody was there for the census. His family is there. He stays. Bethlehem was their new home. So the Magi arrive after who knows how long at this small, humble house that Joseph has acquired. It's not a mansion. It's not a palace. And look, there's been a lot of study on this. There was not just three Magi on camels. The text from Isaiah says, herds of camels will cover your land. There's no doubt in my mind that there were attendants and servants, guys carrying the tents, there were cooks, and most likely a military entourage who escort the three magi. So this was a massive display, which is why Herod and all of Jerusalem were so afraid. And here they come to these humble conditions to find the God of the universe. Their eyes must have told them this cannot be the place. This must not be the one. But Scripture told them otherwise, and that's why they believed the Scriptures over their own eyes. And these Gentiles worship a little Jewish baby. They get on their hands and their knees, and they bow their faces to the ground. You know, nobody else is doing this. Herod's not doing this. None of the inhabitants of Jerusalem are doing this. Not even the teachers of the Torah who pulled the Micah scroll off the shelf and read it to the Magi. Yet the Magi do. For in this boy they have come free of their idols. And like Simeon of old said when he held the little baby Jesus, he is a light to lighten the Gentiles. The Magi are filled with the joy of seeing something holy and healing and forgiving and saving and energizing and life-giving, knowing for certain that God keeps His promises. You know, before this moment, one could argue that the angels in the night sky, when they said, to you is born, to you is born, that they were only referring to Jewish shepherds. When the angels sang, glory to God in the highest and peace to those with whom He is pleased, this again references His people, those in the line of Abraham. But here the scriptural testimony is undeniable. The Christ child is for all people. These Gentiles, these outsiders, these pagan astronomers, they have no claim to the promises of God, neither do we. The Gentiles are sinners, vile ones at that. Yet today we learn that God has come for Gentiles like us. The Magi believe Jesus was born for them, worshiping Him with great joy. And of course, to show further their adoration, they offer what? They offer their gifts. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gifts fit for a king, but extremely practical. Especially for the gold. Because as you know, the Holy Family, as soon as the Magi leave and go to bed that night, when they finally get the little baby Jesus to sleep, what's going to happen? They're going to have to escape that very night. Leave everything now. To make their escape to Egypt, God provides everything the Holy Family needs to support this body and this life. Sure, the Magi were the first Gentiles to worship Jesus, but they certainly were not the last. You Gentiles have seen His light too, not with your eyes, but with your ears. You have beheld His glory as the Holy Spirit has revealed this Christ as your Savior too, as your God and your King. 
You know, as a teenager, I remember receiving, I believe it was from a Sunday school teacher, if I'm not mistaken, I remember receiving a Christmas card that was sent to me. No doubt you've seen it too. On the cover what is what appeared to be the silhouette of the Magi with the caption, Wise Men Still Seeking. I looked at that card, I thought about that, and I thought, man, that is so true. I want to be a wise man. I want to seek Jesus. And beloved, I did. And I looked in every place that I thought Jesus should be. But I didn't look in the places where He actually promised to be. Where He's promised to be is in the font. And at the pulpit. And on the altar. And in His Word. You have found Jesus in these same places. Why? Because He wants to be found by you. Blessed Epiphany, everyone. In the holy name of Jesus, amen. We stand together. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.